I'm in studio today with Dr. Yaki Siliers, the head of Africa Futures and Innovation, also the chairman of the board of the Institute for Security Studies. Yaki, welcome to Gibbs. Thanks, Marius. I believe you've written a new book, uh, Africa First. Uh, tell us about your book. Marius, yes, Africa First. It's uh, the product of about 10 years of work at the ISS. Um, and uh, it basically looks at why is the gap in average incomes between Africa and the rest of the world continuing to increase. And it's done that since the 1960s. So if you draw a graph, it's a picture of widening divergence, like the jaws of a, of a crocodile, a yawning crocodile. So I asked the question, what needs to happen to change that trajectory going forward? And the book um, uh, does 11 scenarios where I look at uh, the impact of a demographic transition, a revolution in agriculture, getting Africa into manufacturing, implementation of the African continental free trade area, and so on and so forth, the impact of carbon emissions on all of these, to see at what point do we start closing that gap between global averages or averages in the rest of the world and African averages. Some might say Africa, it's not a single thing. It's, you know, dozens of countries, all with their own peculiar issues that share perhaps poverty and, you know, youth bulge. How is it that you're able to go about this business of looking at the future of the continent as a whole? How do you do that? Now, we've done a number of country studies. We have looked at South Africa, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, uh, um, Mozambique, Angola, Tunisia, Algeria, and so on and so forth. So we've done detailed country studies. But Africa is hugely complex. Um, so the approach I take more or less in the book, the, the model um, is at a country level, is that I use uh, low, low middle and upper middle income country groupings as defined by the World Bank as the better way of getting a grip because these countries share essential characteristics. Of course, the book is uh, still generalizes and one has to uh, at the end of the day, look at uh, national specifics to be able to understand the dynamics in any specific African country. Africa, of course, has a number of what we might call structural problems. You know, large, uneducated or poorly educated uh, population, high birth rates in sub-Saharan Africa, low levels of investment, low levels of education outcomes. Yet your book, uh, from what I see, paints a fairly optimistic picture about ways in which Africa can improve its prospects. What are some of those key focus areas that it should be looking at? So there's no single magic bullet for Africa. Africa needs to do everything. Uh, it needs to get to on its demographic dividend or advance its demographic dividend. It needs low-income African countries, need an agricultural revolution. Generally, we need a transformation in education and so on and so forth. So it is eventually, ultimately, very country-specific and very yeah, level of development specific. But there is a general standard model of economic description of economic development that uh, I eventually develop in the concluding chapter um, because I model the impact of the 11 transitions on Africa. There's sort of a chapter on each of these 11 uh, transitions. Um, and then I compare them. What is the impact on low income, low middle, upper middle income country? Because the impact differs. You mentioned uh, that there, I think you said 12 scenarios in the book. Um, as someone reading the book, using the book, how would they best get value from the book? Uh, given those 12 scenarios, if, if I'm a policymaker or a business strategist, how should I be using this material? There's a chapter that deals with every specific theme. So if you're interested in trade or the future of jobs or work, go to that chapter. Because what, the, what each chapter does, it sort of takes the basics of, let's say, trade, the relationship between globalization and trade, or the history, Africa's role in global trade, and what the prospects are, for example, of the implementation of the African continental free trade area. So every specific chapter uh, is, uh, deals with a theme that needs transformation. Uh, and uh, it looks at the impact of two or three. For example, I look at the impact of carbon emissions across my, uh, some of the key scenarios. And I look at the impact of jobs, of uh, employment growth across various scenarios. So I compare them. And in that way, there are 11 scenarios. And I eventually put them together and sort of say, what is an Africa first, a most optimistic, all good things come together scenario where you see Africa uh, starting to um, to really transform itself structurally. You're, of course, collaborating with us here at the Center for Dialogue on a Africa conference looking at the future of Africa. Talk to us a little bit about that initiative and, and what's behind that. Yes, sir. We're very pleased and honored to, to work, uh, Marius, with you and colleagues at Gibbs. So based, in a sense, on the book, uh, on the 2nd and 3rd of September of this year, 
We hope, in collaboration with Gibbs, to uh, host a large conference here at Gibbs that looks at the future of Africa, that looks at certain thematic issues, and then takes uh, certain countries, looks at specific countries, and look at issues that uh, uh, confront Africa generally, but also to look at methodologies, at how one approaches, how one can think about the future, and what the different tools are that we would use to look at the future of Africa. We'll, of course, be working with other partners to develop streams or focal areas in the conference. Uh, one of them we'll be working on is, of course, around the methods that we've used, you in your book and we in the work we do at Gibbs, on what we call strategic foresight or future studies or forecasting. Why do you think this as a skill set is important for African decision makers today? I think it is hugely important. The world is changing so rapidly that we, we need to spend more time looking at where we want to go and what drives that future. Um, unless you want to be a victim of circumstance. And when, as the two of us look at structural drivers, in actual fact, the future and what is happening becomes much clearer. That allows companies and countries to position themselves and to look at where in this emerging new world order um, and with the relationships and the changes within Africa, they can position themselves. My final question, Yaki, looking at through all this data and material and, and the way in which it interacts, what surprised you? What stood out for you as a new insight that you had? I think many things. I think the, the, the most important is simply the realization of structurally what a long path Africa has. Uh, we often, in the futures world, we often do blue skies thinking. If this can change, if that can change, somehow we can miraculously uh, change our, our future. But uh, the future requires investment, particularly in innovation and in knowledge production and in changing the productive structures. There are certain opportunities for leapfrogging, and there's a whole chapter on that. But I think that composition of exactly how uh, steep that hill is that we have to climb and the challenges that lie ahead. I think a second one, if you'll, if you'll allow me, is um, I underestimated, th there's the old saying, demographics is destiny. And I certainly have underestimated the impact of demographics. It is a, one of the first transitions I deal with in the book, and it is quite fundamental. Africa only gets to its demographic dividends, sub-Saharan Africa, in the second half of the century. By that point, labor, which is the major contribution that Africa can make, labor, capital, and technology, is changed. Uh, so uh, demographics is hugely important on carbon emissions and a variety of other areas. Yaki, I look forward to reading the book and to working with you on the conference. Uh, please join us in September on the 2nd and 3rd. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Marius. Thank you.